Welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I will be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. For more information, you can go to the website svos.org. You can also get an artist directory at your local library. Our guest is Christine Oliver, a watercolorist who paints beautiful landscapes and still life paintings. She also uses acrylics and creates very interesting three-dimensional mixed media collages. In addition to her artwork, she also is the marketing director for Silicon Valley Open Studios and we're going to hear all of her new ideas for promoting the SVOS artists. So welcome, Christine. Thank you, Sally. It's great to be here. Yes. Um, so why don't we start with some of your background in art. How did you get started as an artist? I um, got my Bachelor of Fine Arts from the State University of New York at Binghamton. And um, when I graduated, I took my fine arts portfolio around okay. to several ad agencies. And they basically said, nice fine arts portfolio, but you're not qualified to work here. So I said, what can I do? And they uh, directed me to a graphic arts um, school. So I went for two years and became a graphic artist and worked at an agency. So how long did you work in an ad agency? About a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And then um, the corporate world called and said they were looking for an advertising director. So um, I switched from the creative side to the corporate side, but I still used my graphic arts. So how did they, how did art in, was involved in marketing? That's a little bit. Yeah, it was really interesting because um, with the um, graphic arts that I learned, I was able to then buy art from uh, designers and direct agency um, artists and, and, and designers. So it really worked well. I, you know, felt very comfortable telling them what we needed for the company. Oh, very nice. So you were informed, you know, you could talk about the compositions that you wanted and things like that. Yes. Very interesting. And so how did you then become a watercolorist? Um, I worked in a uh, corporate world for about 20 years, and I was a director of marketing communications for medical device and high-tech firms. And I realized at one point that I was totally depleted. I had, you know, mm -hmm. kind of worked all my life and worked really hard, but I wasn't doing anything that was replenishing me and giving me energy. So I went back to art school and started okay. painting and uh, started that about 15, 16 years ago. And I've been painting ever since. So, Excellent, yeah. yes. So now when you work in watercolors, tell us a little bit about the materials that you use and some of the tools that you use. Absolutely. Um, it's really easy to start out with a very limited um, palette. You can start out with maybe 12 different colors and, you know, um, and a few brushes. And the watercolors and the brushes can be pretty uh, expensive. So if you want to start out small, you can do that. And watercolor paper is very, very important. If you use a high-grade cotton paper, 100% mm -hmm. cotton, then it's a much more forgiving surface and you can actually change things and you can modify your paintings and you have a lot more resilience in the paper. So you don't ruin it if you try to erase something. Yeah, that, <laughs> you can, but, yeah, but it's easier you, yeah, if you're uh, careful. Well, one of the um, things that's a friend to watercolorists is uh, like a bristle brush so you can kind of lift up the, the paint from the paper and that's the way you kind of erase and correct mm -hmm. things. So when you're starting, when you start a painting, how do you start from the initial idea? What inspires you and then how do you progress from there? Um, there's a couple of different um, subjects that I like to paint. I do watercolors, or I mean landscapes a lot. And uh, a couple of years ago I got very interested in roosters. So I started painting roosters. And um, those are the things that that kind of capture my interest mm -hmm. and um, 
that I like to paint. So I just paint things that, that appeal to me, either from nature or um, a design standpoint. Do you paint outside? I do, at times. I went to Scotland um, a couple years ago, and mm -hmm. we painted en plein air. So we stayed at uh, Black Craig Castle, which was a castle in the middle <laughs> of the uh, country, and we went out each day to a different um, location and actually painted on site. Oh, it was very nice. It was wonderful. Yeah. So when you're outside, what do you do first? I take a little um, slide frame. And I look at the landscape and check the area that I think I'm going to, going to paint. If I look through that, then I know that that is the, the area. Mm -hmm. Then so I do... You, so you frame it already frame before it. you even paint it. You know what the frame is. Exactly, exactly. Because you can imagine being outside. Right. It's big, and you, yes. can do, you can paint everything and anything. And what you really want to do is you want to... I, identify what would be really good from a composition or color standpoint. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do you take photographs? I do take photographs and then I do a value sketch. And the value sketch um, is what uh, lets me see composition wise. And the reason I take the photograph is that um, light changes very quickly yes. when you're painting all plein air. And that is a reference. So if I don't finish the painting while I'm standing there, then I can absolutely uh, use that as a reference, use the photograph as a reference later, and I can paint from that. Right, and, and then the, the value sketch looks like a black and white pencil drawing. Exactly, exactly. For good composition, you want to put your lightest lights and your darkest darks next to each other, and that sets up the, um, the greatest... Um, uh, pleasing, most pleasing composition. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. So you brought some images of watercolors that you've created, landscapes that are um, mostly watercolors. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let's mm -hmm. take a look at those now, and you can tell us a little bit about your techniques and how you started. Okay. I did a series of um, lighthouses. There's four um, in this series. And I took these actually from a calendar, and I just fell in love with the lighthouses. And I liked um, primarily what I was looking for in these is um, the drama of the sky. You'll notice in some of them the skies are really um, dramatic. This one, Yakina Head, is I believe in. Um, I don't even remember where That's it was right. from. It's Sorry. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Um, this one I know was uh, Portland, obviously, Portland, Maine. And um, it was interesting. I was just there last fall and went to this lighthouse and didn't even realize that I had painted it about two years earlier until we went on a boat ride on the bay and I saw it from this angle. And I said, oh my gosh, I painted that. Yeah, it's beautiful. This one is, um, I love this because of the sky, and, and that's what I was trying to capture. It's like um, sunset, and it's, you can just tell that the sun's going down. And, and, and I really like the composition. I'm looking at the light, lights and the dark darks, like you said before, and I can really see how you work that and the, how everything comes together in that point just off center. It's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Now this, I was in Belize, and we were going to a um, Mayan ruin, and I just snapped a picture of our, our taxi driver. Every place you go where we were staying was on an island, and so we had to go by boat. And it was just a very natural um, uh, photograph, so I loved painting it. Very nice. This is Sierra, a, a lake in the Sierra, Eastern Sierras and I did a series there. This happens to be with pastels as well as watercolor. So I can see in the grass. Yes. Very you, pastel like. Yeah. Do you do the pastels after the watercolor? Yes. Oh, yeah. Usually the, the watercolor first and then the pastels and because pastels are a water media you can move it around and paint with it. This again all of these were done en plein air, started in the field and then finished in the studio. Thank you. 
Yeah, a lot of good color in the aspens were changing back then. And this one was done in uh, Venezuela, Playa Santa Fe. And again, I painted while I was on the beach. Beautiful. I like the way the blue and the yellow are really well balanced in it. Yeah, the, you know, um, on the color wheel, the purple and yellow are exact opposites, so they really complement each other. Well, you brought in some paper and some paints to demonstrate for us, some brushes, so why don't we do that now and take I, a look? I did. Um, what I do is I start with a little value sketch that I showed you before, and then I put it um, to the, I, I put it on my block, and I'm painting from a watercolor block, which is glued at the edges so it doesn't um, wrinkle when you use water with it. I also start with a very large brush. I like to work with a large brush. It keeps things um, loose and a little more, uh, uh, a little, how shall I say it, um, more abstract, if you will. Um, a lot of times you've heard probably watercolorists say um, wet on wet. And the wet on wet is um, when you wet the paper and you actually paint into um, a wet paint paper. And so you're painting plain water right now. I am. I'm plain. This is just plain water. Now I'll mix. And, and the style that I do is um, it's four layers. And um, you start with uh, light or top to bottom. Back for, uh, background to foreground, light to dark, and then the fourth layer is actually the um, uh, shadows that you put in. And the shadows ground the painting um, and really make it, um, uh, you can see the, th the dimensions coming to it. Right, then. makes it more realistic. Absolutely. And a real friend of a watercolorist is, um, believe it or not, um, Kleenex, because I can actually create my clouds by just lifting up my um, my paint. That's and great. So it, Kleenex is like a little eraser. Yes, yes. In this particular case, very much so. And what you want to do is you want to um, get all of your colors in on the first layer as much as possible, so that um, so that you're painting, um, if you have white space with watercolor, obviously you want um, the paper to be the white. But when you're um, when you're actually painting, and these uh, particular um, mountains actually had uh, they had snow on them, so I'm going to leave a little bit of white for that area, and. Um, what kind of paints are you using? I use a, a number of different kinds. Windsor Newton is a very good paint. Um, another kind is, um, uh, let's say, Grumbacher. So those are the two that I use the most. Is there any particular grade or quality that you choose? Yeah, um, if you use student grade, the paints are a lot less expensive but you don't have the pigment that you would find in um, professional grade, they call it. So I try to use professional grade as much as I possibly can. And that um, kind of, that helps to um, uh, give you really good solid colors and colors that don't um, actually fade later on. Um, so that's really important. You definitely want to make sure that you are, um, that you have good um, quality paints that are uh, re not, that are resistant to fading. Absolutely. So what you try to do is put in as much of your color as you possibly can. This particular day, it, this was in the Eastern Sierras also, and um, I want to make sure that we have. Um, the, some of the fall colors in, in the painting. 
and I'll start to um, put in some of the shapes of the trees as I'm doing this, and then I can always go back in a little bit later. And you said you're working light to dark? Light to dark, right. And background um, to foreground, I can see that. Yeah, and the reason you do light to dark, it's exactly pretty much opposite of uh, acrylics and oils because um, you want, you can always go darker with, um, with your uh, painting, but it's hard to lighten it with a, um, with watercolor. So you definitely want to make sure that you um, get as much of your, um, you can build, you can actually build as you're, as you're starting to um, create your shapes and you can always go in and, and um, do darker shapes. So this will, I'll, I'll give you an idea of what the first layer would look like. And then I'm going to go in with a brush that's called a round. And that will um, start to uh, build out the shapes of the um, actual trees. And, you, and then you can start to see the textures starting to form. So how are you choosing your colors? Are, do you use the reference photograph or are these colors that you're imagining? Um, I usually use the reference um, photograph, but I have um, artist prerogative so I can change it. <laughs> and, and, um, and that's always nice because sometimes you'll have a um, telephone pole right in the middle of a really nice um, um, uh, landscape and you don't want that. I mean you definitely want to make sure that you're doing the very best um, you know and using the the best uh, composition. So it, it's really fun to you know kind of change things up a little bit. Okay so now I've got most of my first layer in and um, and I've pretty quick. And yeah, it, it can go With very quickly. Brush. And you know, actually when you're painting outside, um, depending, it, you have atmospheric pressures um, or atmospheric conditions. And um, sometimes what you want is um, to have a spray bottle because you'll need to spray it every once in a while. So that kind of gives you an idea of how to put the first layer. Then I'll go in with what is called a round. And this will allow me to start shaping and adding textures in the second layer. What size is that? This one, I believe, is a 16. Yeah. And I, I usually try to do um, pretty large, um, pretty large brushes. Again, I like the fact that um, that it, it's, I like watercolor to look like watercolor and not to necessarily look like a photograph. And you can absolutely get um, painters that, that do um, things that look like pa um, photographs. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I like the spontaneity. And I don't even mind, when I work on an easel like this, I don't even mind that some of the paint drips. Um, because that, again, is very, um, it's very earthy, and, um, and that works really well. And one of the techniques that you want to use is called um, color mixing, and you want to use the same color in multiple places in your painting, so that it, it's called color weaving, actually, and it really brings everything together so that, um, it, it looks like it's a unified part uh, um, piece, and it's not, you know, uh, different things that are all, that don't relate. It helps so to relate. So you're starting the second layer now. Yes, this is the second layer. And, and I will work with that and, and actually, you know, put in the details and, um, and, and finish it up, and that'll, that, but that gives me a good start for this. And it's nice and still wet, and, and you want to figure out, sometimes you want to work wet and wet, and sometimes not so wet. 
right, sometimes for the detail. dry for the details. Yeah. So you brought some other images of some very different pieces that are watercolors with some collage. So let's yes. talk about those and take a look at those now. Okay. So there's one. What is this? This is a series that I did, and it's um, a series with um, uh, my roosters, and each one is labeled something different. Um, this one's called Something's Fishy, and you can see from the fish that's coming in from one side of the painting, and it's very difficult to see, but there's a little glass fish that hangs on the um, back toward the tail of the um, rooster, and that is actually three-dimensional. So <laughs> when it's framed, it's framed so that the um, plexiglass is away from it. Um, I used in this case, stamps and um, the backs of Polaroid photographs. So mm -hmm. that's the back that you would typically throw away, and I used that in this series. It was very fun. This one's called um, This Chick's a Knockout. And you can see the, um, the green boxing glove coming in from the top. Right. And the little three-dimensional item, the totem in this, is the little heart th that's hanging on the... Um, on the um, rooster, and then the, there's a female swimmer there. So that, when I say this chick's a knockout, it's kind of a, <laughs> you know. Yes, play on words. Play on words, exactly. 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 This one is called What a Cocky Attitude. Um, I just thought, oh my gosh, he's really in your face, and he just looks like he's ready to just, you know, come at you. There's um, two little items, again, kind of hard to see, one are um, little glass beads that are hanging off of the um, rooster, and then right above the uh, darker element next to the um, Polaroid back is a small um, magnolia tulip tree seed. Oh. And I use a lot of natural elements, I try, in, in many of the pieces. This one is um, called Time's Running Out. At the bottom, there's a tiny uh, photograph of uh, Yosemite Falls. And with the, uh, the collage time pieces with the clocks, okay. that is just kind of my statement on time's running out and environmental. So that was my environmental statement. And this last one is called Sing for Your Supper. And again, you'll notice an, a eucalyptus um, uh, leaf and w the leaf that is under it is one of those leaves that has lost, uh, it just has the cellulose showing. But those are beautiful, beautiful collages. Thank you. I've had so much fun with the, um, with the rooster ones. And Love the roosters it. are watercolor paint. They are watercolor. I start with the watercolor mm -hmm. and then I add the collage items. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're going to change topic a little bit because okay. I'm very interested in marketing. As every artist is, we all have questions. How do we let people know what is going on and what's going on? You yeah. know? So, and how much do you say and how much do you send out? Right now, everybody's overwhelmed with emails. So, tell us a little bit about your job as the marketing director for Silicon Valley Open Studios and what you have organized for all of us artists who are getting ready for our shows in May? Well, we just finished um, the second phase of SVOS University. We've done the first phase and then the second phase. The first phase was on um, uh, setting up or marketing your work. And that was held uh, a couple of weeks ago in both Campbell and um, also in um, San, in Redwood City. And we, this is the artist directory. The that 2013. This is 2013. Up. It just hot off the presses. It just came out uh, end of last week. And these are being distributed to the artists now. And the nice thing about the artist directory, um, they're de delivered to all the public libraries and you'll find them in art um, supply stores and you'll also find them in um, community centers and in the boxes that are on the street where you can get the newspaper. And you can see that right. it has a photograph of the artist's work. And there are maps that are inside. And you can map out your, your plan of who you want to see and what weekend. And we also have. And these are the 
the postcards, postcards. that artists can send out to their clients yes patrons. absolutely so those are um, all being distributed now and the other thing is we have um, a four page insert of what this artist directory looks like in the Gentry magazine this year and Gentry magazine goes to 35,000 um, high-income homes up and down the peninsula. Oh, excellent. Yeah, very and nice. so we're very, very pleased. They're our media sponsor this year, and we're thrilled to be working with them and uh, getting the word out about SVOS. And how would an artist market their own art show? Um, a lot of different ways, and it's changing. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, postcards were the big thing um, you know, five years ago or six right. years ago. Now social media is the main thing. So um, often we tell in SVOS University, we tell the artists to have um, a Facebook fan page to um, definitely point um, all of your communications back to your website, if you have a website, um, to, uh, you know, go to the SVOS fan page and like the and follow it so mm -hmm. that also other people on your uh, Facebook page sees uh, see the go knows about the SVOS well, page. Excellent. And tell us a little bit about your future plans. Well, what, I, what are you doing? <laughs> I have this series that I am just dying to do, and this is going to be in acrylics. However, it's also going to be with roosters, but I want to do roosters. Um, that are fashioned after fav, uh, fav, famous people. So the first one is going to be Jack Chickelson, and that's <laughs> and that's Jack Nicholson. And the rooster happens to have one of these um, uh, coxcombs that looks like horns, yeah, honestly. Very and nice. I think of the devil in the Witches of Eastwick. So that's so tell what us I'm doing. some of the other titles briefly. Um, I want to do one with um, Chick Jagger, and this is a tall, skinny uh, bantam, and it has a great big, um, you know, beak. beak. Yeah, <laughs> and I want to put leather pants on him. All of these will be collages mm -hmm. and three-dimensional, so I, I'm having a lot of fun thinking of them and, and wanting to get started. Well, thank you so much for being on Talk Art. It was a very interesting demonstration and really look forward to the open studios. Thank you very much, Sally. Yeah. I'm pleased to be here. Thanks. Excellent.